In our last couple of videos, we've been looking at Vantage Point and what used to be there and how it's changed today. And we've gone in all directions, but uh, now we're going to head west and go up Water Street and up here and some of the side streets. But thanks uh, to this wonderful video that uh, came courtesy of Paul Murray uh, of uh, the area from an aerial view. You get a great uh, bird's eye view. A bird's eye view that will actually help you, uh, well, remember where some of these places are. Sometimes it's hard to place them. And uh, with this uh, view here uh, that we have, thanks to Paul, uh, I can show you where some of these things were perhaps a little bit easier. We'll go as far as uh, the Military Street Bridge and then, well, we'll go over on the Water Street and see what's there. There have been many changes in Black River in the last hundred years. Uh, and one of these changes were coming up here. Uh, here you see the Basque Bridge, but uh, 100 years ago or so, uh, it wasn't. It was a swing bridge, as you can see here on the left. Of course, this bridge pivoted on the center, and uh, the ferries coming in would have to go to the right side of it, and then the ferries coming out would have to go on the opposite side. And there wasn't a lot of room to maneuver. But it was a, quite a unique bridge. I always liked the swing bridges. The grassy area you see on the right was uh, owned by John Howard at one time, and this is where he had the Howard Lumber Mill. And that grass, of course, uh, went all the way to St. Clair River. This property also went west a ways as well, so it was quite a bit of property there on the riverfront, both riverfronts actually. We'll look at more of Howard's property in just a few seconds. All right, let's move along a little bit further. You can see here where the Basque Bridge would have came down when it was in operation on the south side of the river. And just right next to the track, uh, just west of that track, was the Porcher and Gas and Light Company and later on the Light and Power Company. The picture of that building that you see here is actually looking to the north. Uh, and you can see the swing bridge in the background. We'll look more into this building later in the video. As we continue our little journey down the river past the bridge, uh, about uh, where this marina area is here, this was also uh, John Howard's property and part of the sawmill. This whole area here is where uh, the mill would capture the logs coming down Black River, and then they would sort them there, and they were. Uh, Put into a pen and they can see the constraints going around those logs. Going a little higher in this video we get a wonderful view of this area and this uh, portion that's enclosed by the red line that was all Howard's mill. So he owned a lot of property. It was actually considered uh, John Howard estate on the maps. And this photograph here gives you a view of that mill. Uh, we're actually looking from the opposite direction, but you get an idea how much property that uh, mill actually consumed. And then uh, while we're here, if you just go above it, just a little bit to the north, adjacent to the property, you'll come up with the uh, dry dock that was there at the time. The buildings you see to the right of the dry dock are, are the, the buildings from the lumber company, the Howard Lumber Company. So they were very close together, just adjacent to each other. And as we go a little bit further on Black River, we'll see that there were some other things here right next to the Howard Mill. There was a coal and wood company that is pictured here. And of course you can see the cores of wood all stacked up there, ready for sale. Um, can't see the coal though. And then before that, there was a, a lime company here. And in this photo here, it's hard to see it, but that white uh, there uh, inside the rectangle, uh, that's all the uh, tiles of the components needed for the lime. Also notice in some of the earlier pictures, the Poirier and Sarnia ferries were actually docked closer to the St. Clair River than they were to the ferry docks that we remember. And that was because that's where the ferry dock was at that time. If you look at this photograph here, uh, you can see that booth there on the left where it says ferry ticket office. Of course, at the time the picture was taken, they were no longer using that, but the booth was still there. As we continue going uh, west on Black River, uh, we come to the Port Yacht Club. 
can see the building there. And just past this building, uh, right, right about here. This is the location where the Porcher and Ferry, the Omar Conqueror, exploded. I know many people think it was closer to the bridge, but it was uh, quite a ways back. We can tell this by looking in the background here. We see the W.J. Scott building, uh, and that was uh, basically on the corner, close to the corner of Fort Street and Quay. All right, as we continue our little journey on the river here, uh, we're not going to cover everything that's along here because we covered some in our previous videos. I just thought it'd be kind of neat to do it this way, look at a few things that uh, might help you realize where they were. As we come up closer to the bridge here on the right, you'll see where the ferries used to dock. Of course, during my generation, this is what the ferry dock looked like, uh, and this is what the ferries looked like that I remember in Rogan. But before my time, uh, back in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, there was a different type of ferry here. As you can see, the Jane Beard pulling away from the ferry dock, and the ferry dock uh, looked quite a bit different back then. As we continue along here, we come, of course, to the Military Street Bridge, and here's something that's gone through several changes over the years. First, uh, we have this as the earliest known photograph of the bridge, a bow bridge. And uh, this was called the White Bridge, whether it was white in color or white because of it was a white plat, uh, I don't know. But then after that, there was this bridge here, and I call this U Like Port Jern Bridge. And uh, this is on quite a few postcards, and this is a postcard that you see here. Then we come to what I call the bridge with an overhead. Of course, the overhead uh, rails you see there were for the streetcars that carried the electric cable for them. Then we come to an early version of the current bridge, uh, which is shown here, uh, showing the old control house. And, uh, of course, on this bridge, back then, the, uh, the walkways were made out of wood plank. You could just walk across and look down and see the river. And they also had very decorative railings as well. All right, as we... Uh, go over the bridge, hover uh, over the bridge, and we look out at this view of Black River. Uh, here's what it looked like uh, over a hundred years ago. This is when logging was the main industry in Port Jern at that time. And you can see the Military Street Bridge with that fellow standing on it there. Okay, since we're here, let's do one more as we slowly pan over uh, looking down Huron Avenue at the main heart of the city. Uh, we see what it looks like today, but then here is what we see it looked like in 1857. Quite a bit of difference. All right, I told you that's uh, as far as we we're going to go, the Military Street Bridge, and then we're going to go back and hit the streets like we normally do. I just thought that was uh, something different. Let's go back to the, uh, the foot of Water Street and see what was there. Looking down from the satellite view, you can see that Water Street uh, wraps around now and uh, Grizzle Street wraps around and they meet uh, pretty much at Court Street. But originally this was called First Street. It ran from uh, Water Street uh, south. And then you can see Third Street on this map. But originally there was a Second Street in there as well, right in the middle. So you had Third, Second, and First Street. And you can see from this map of 1903, 3rd Street on the far left. And then on the right, you have 1st Street. But right in the middle, uh, you have 2nd Street. And both 2nd and 1st Street pretty much just ran through the railroad yards. At the foot of Water Street, we have the Port and Light and Power Company, which is shown on this map, as you can see here. And this is what it looked like at the street level. To better understand what this building represents, uh, we have to go back uh, before uh, the electricity to the very first utility, and that would of course be the gas company. On the southwest corner of Military and Water Street back on April 2nd, 1870, a group of 14 businessmen assembled. At that time, it was a banking house of John Johnston and Company. The occasion was the organization of the Port Jern Gaslight Company. 
the first gas company and first public utility of any kind in the city. Only five of the businessmen were from Port Huron. The rest were investors from Ann Arbor. Four Huron businessmen that were at that meeting were John Howard and Edgar White, John Miller, John Johnston, and Charles Harrington. The first business of the Port Huron Gas Light Company was to appropriate $20,000 to lay the two miles of mains called for in the ordinance. 2,000 of this was allocated to lay an 8-inch main across Black River. And at the time, uh, one of the businessmen from Ann Arbor claimed that there was only one other city in the United States where a river as large as Black River was crossed by gas mains, and that was the city of Toledo, Ohio. Within a month of the organization of the company, construction of the gas plant was begun. It was first intended to locate the plant on the bank of the St. Clair River, just north of the mouth of Black River. This would have been the area that we looked at previously in our video. It would have been just east of the railroad bridge and uh, a little bit north, where the uh, all the sawmill and then the dry dock was. But it was found impossible to excavate for the gasometer, which is just the big gas tanks, the storage. It was impossible for excavate for the gas meter there without great expense because of quicksand, which was the same problem William Jinx ran into when he tried to build his shipbuilding company on the St. Clair River in that same location. The Common Council then authorized the company to locate their works on the north bank of the Black River, provided they were not within 300 feet of either military or 7th Street bridges. And as you can see on this map here, the storage tank was put right in the center of the downtown area. I'm not sure that would be done today. And it went from one tank, and as uh, the business expanded, so did their tanks. You can see in this one, they're showing two tanks. And again, as business increased, so did the tanks. And this one here, we see that there's four tanks now, right in the center of Port Sharon. And in case you haven't figured it out, the triangle that these gas tanks set in were uh, between the Butler or now Grand River and uh, River Street or Quay and then Huron Avenue. In this rare aerial photograph, and I say rare because it's very unusual in that time period to see something taken from an airplane, and you can tell the time period because, well, the ferries that you see on the right hand side, those are the older ferries. Then, of course, the, the gas tank that you see here as well. In this photograph here, you can see the, the gas tank sitting right uh, in the center. Uh, to give you a point of reference, that's the courthouse in the background. And at the time that this picture was taken, it appears to be only one gas tank there. But in this photograph here, you can now see two gas tanks. Uh, one to the left of the original one that we just looked at. And that second tank is the one you see here at street level, or a little above street level, I guess. But you can see it quite clearly, and uh, in that background, that's the First Baptist Church. The gas holder, or gas meter, capable of holding 25,000 cubic feet of gas was installed. The main across Black River was finished, and two and a half miles of street mains had been laid, as well as 70 service pipes. 22 lamp posts covering two miles had been put up in the city streets, and the first of these was lighted the night of December 13, 1870. The lamplighter became a familiar figure in Port Huron, making his rounds. The lamps were lit according to the Irish Almanac. When the moon was coming up, the lights were not turned on until it had disappeared. During the period of full moon, the lights were not turned on at all for three nights unless the moon was obscured by clouds. We've just been looking at two different ways to light those uh, lamp posts. Uh, one would go walking around with a long uh, pole with a flame on the end, and the other one was carrying a ladder with you and climb on the ladder, which seems to be what a lot, a lot of lamplighters did. That isn't the way they did it in Port Huron. Arthur Boynton, who worked for the gas companies in Port Huron for over 50 years, said the lamplighter made his rounds on a spavined old mare. Well, I didn't know what spavin meant either, but it means the disease of the joints. Anyway, this mare was trotting from post to post with the lamplighter on his back with his torch in hand. This torch was a shielded flame on the end of a staff, also equipped with sort of a key which would turn on and off the gas cock, 
As each lamp was reached, the lamplighter rose in the stirrups, lit the lamp, and then plodded on to the next lamp post. Just before midnight, he made his rounds again and turned the lights off. I wish I would have had a picture of that. The people of Port Yearn, however, and especially the merchants and owner of business blocks, were slow to show an appreciation of the great advantages of gaslight. In fact, even up to the September of 1871, there were only 64 customers of gas in the city. And I'm sure that cartoons like this didn't help to ease their fears. Remember, these are folks that went from a candle uh, to the wonderful invention of the kerosene lamp, and that was safer. I mean, it was enclosed, but now you got actual gas, which is explosive, coming into your home. What could possibly go wrong with that? And, and I think that was their fears. But eventually those fears were overcome, and they realized that gaslight really was the best. Eventually it became quite commonplace to use the gas lamp in their homes and, of course, businesses. Uh, the original ones, of course, mostly were ceiling ones, but then they realized that they could adapt. They could run uh, gas lines from the ceiling to the uh, desk lamps, and that was a big improvement, too. By 1873, the conveniences of gas seemed to become more attractive to the people. The cleanliness of gas and the ease with which it was lighted and the continuous brilliant light without drudgery all went over the dim and sometimes smelly illumination of kerosene lamps. The once stubborn merchants began to realize that the gloomy appearance of their kerosene lighted stores was losing patrons to the more brilliantly lighted establishments of their competitors where gas was burned. But there was a competitor looming on the horizon, the electric company. And we'll learn more about that in our next video.